It was an absolute honor hosting Dr. Kiran Bedi on the Ranvi show. This particular episode is meant for the entire female workforce of India. If you're an Indian woman, I urge you to listen to this episode till the end but also share it with all the working professionals that you know. I feel conversations need to be had like this in order to boost the Indian workforce's mentality and morale. Dr. Kiran Bedi is a legend in the story of post-independence India. We didn't really cover her story because I feel like most people know about it. This particular episode was more about her mindset, more about where India is at right now and where we need to take India going forward. As Kunal Jha said on TRS, only about 5-10% to 10 of Indian urban women are a part of the workforce and that's got to change. May that change begin with conversations like this. This is Dr. Kiran Bedi featured on The Ranveer Show. Remember to follow TRS on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Remember, Dr. Bedi's book, Fearless Governance, is now out. I'm going to link it down below. But for now, I hope you enjoy this conversation that taught me so much. I hope it creates a similar impact in your lives. Enjoy the episode. Dr. Kiran Bedi, welcome to the Ranveer Show. It's beyond an honor having you. Thank you for being on the show today, ma'am. Thank you very much, young man. So, ma'am, my first question to you is um, not to you. It's to the little girl inside you because I feel like our inner child never dies. So, for that inner child in you, what, why did you choose to get into public service? Like, there must have been some kind of seed of inspiration somewhere. So, I want to hear about that firstly. Well, I knew that the position in government is a position of influence where you can get things done because I saw my father getting things done. My father belonged to a, a very influential family of Amritsar when I was growing up and he was a go-to person. Mm. My grandfather was a go-to person because they were influential. And what did he do? To help others in need because people would approach him for help. And I was as a teenager watching it, listening to it. And he would call up the superintendent of police. He would call up the collector and get things done, which were right. Of course, my father was only supporting, which was legitimately the due. And I used to get see him getting things done, but also justice happening. So it settled in my mind that the go-to people are the people in government. And, and those in public service in these positions. And if I, when I grow up, I too can get things done. Why can't I also be one day be in public service where I can also be of help to others? I can also be what, do what my father is getting done through somebody else, but he's getting it done. He's getting justice done. So mm. I started to see him getting justice delivered justice done, but expedited. So why can't I be that person to whom he's calling, who would be delivering justice? Mm. Right? So I love this. It settled in my mind that why I would one day grow up also to be that person who can get things done and does justice. See, two things, get things done and do justice. Yeah, I hear you, ma'am. That's the emotional core behind, I feel, your entire life's journey. So now the question is not to the inner child, it's to the woman that you've become now. I believe that when you look at the life of any person, I used to believe that we become more of ourselves until a friend corrected me and told me that, no, you don't become more of yourself. You become more of what the world paints onto you. And as life progresses, you keep learning, you keep evolving and you become something that you weren't at the beginning. So I want to ask you the same question now. When you look back at your life, one, were those two emotions fueled? And I'm sure they were. But how do you look back at those two emotions now? Justice and, can I call the other one power? Like, you tell me, what would you call the other one? How do, how do you look back at all this? That's the question. It's been an amazing growth exactly of these two. Constant justice getting done. And on slow, constant getting things done. Ex the areas expanded. Geography expanded. Departments divided. Beneficiaries expanded, expanded, everything expanded exponentially as I grew in my positions. 
as I grew up in and as I grew in experience. I mm. could get things done because of my learned experience. So the more I learned, the more I could use my power of influence, my power mm. of position. It was I realized how brilliantly power was such a beautiful responsibility, how you can get things done. In fact, in my acceptance speech, which you may would come to the Maxis Award, when I went to accept when I made an acceptance speech, when I got the Max's Award, I said, policing is the power to correct, power to do, and power to get things done. Mm. I never, this is my speech I wrote at the, and spoke at the acceptance speech in 1994, 31st of August, when I got the Max's Award in Manila, when I delivered it in Manila. It has become one of the uh, well-known speeches in, in memorable speeches. And it, it flew out of my heart. And it is exactly getting things done and the power mm. to correct. And positioning of power to correct, power to do, and power to get things done. I think it grew exponentially. Ma'am, if we dial back once again, there was no part of you growing up in the 50s, 60s, and even early 70s that thought to yourself, hold on, in this world that's full of men, and powerful men at that. I want to be the first woman IPS officer. Was there not a part of you that, you know, had some amount of self-doubt? Because all of us go through that. I'd love to hear about your early forms of self-doubt, especially related to you being a woman. Was there any factor like that early on? Absolutely. When I was growing up, I was growing up to be a self-reliant woman, a self-dependent woman, and a powerful woman who is empowering, who's to grow up empowering others. I did not grow up to become a dependent woman, a seeking woman and seeking help. But, but financially, psychologically, environmentally be free. I was looking for freedom, self-reliance, self-dependence, self-empowerment. See, I knew that if I do not do this, I knew because I saw around dependence. I saw trans migration of women. See, woman is the biggest migrant in the world because Indian woman, when she leaves her parents' home, she goes into another woman. She's a migrant. She migrates, leaving a home which she grew up, got an identity of her own, and suddenly migrates to another home, accepts that as her home, right? And if she's not economically self-dependent, then she's dependent. I did not want either. I did not want to be a migrant. And I did not want to be a dependent woman. I wanted to have a home of my own, certainly. But the point not as a migrant and not to lose my own identity. And when I was growing up as a teenager, I was consciously building my, uh, my building. I was building this architecture that as I grew up, I will take the civil services examination after my master's in political science. And then I would sit for the examination. And policing cap, I did not know I was going to be the first woman in the officer ranks of the Indian police. I did not know that. It's only when I got to the academy of the administration and I was called by the Ministry of Home Affairs asking me, can I consider changing my option? I said, why? They said, because there's no woman prior to you in the Indian police service. I said, I, I haven't entered to become the first woman. It's destiny which has made me become the first woman. But that's where I belong. Because I want to be in, in a position of justice. I want to reform. I want to transform. I want to be of value to the others. Because I was already a woman of value within. I was already highly valued within. I was a self-dependent, confident very well physically, very energetic and fit because I was a tennis player as well. So I was, see, physically, psychologically, spiritually, I was getting, I was already ready for the service. I was there to serve. I wasn't, I didn't even know what my salary would be. I did not look for that. I just said, that's a position where, you remember when I said when I was a child, that's a position I wanted to be of value until now, even when I'm at this age, every day has gone into empowering others. Mm. 
Ma'am, I'm going to be very candid with you here. Uh, because of this podcast, I get to speak to a lot of people who have been in positions of power, who are currently in positions of power. And when I talk to men from your generation versus women from your generation, which is yourself, I, I see that there's a lot of personality differences. And my reading of it, and I might be completely wrong here, I was born in 1993 and I've lived in a very different time. But my reading of it is that I feel women have a natural sense of what in Hindi we call mamta. You know, slight motherly nature, caring, like better levels of empathy. And I somewhere feel that there are men often who lack that. And even men of my generation are trying to build that consciously. So keeping that in mind, like scanning your entire career and all the experiences that you had, do you think that being a woman brings its own strengths to the table in professional environments? Because from what you say, I hear that you gave much more importance to your mission and your motive rather than the fact that, oh, I am a woman, you know? But I'm sure you must have discovered things about yourself as you went ahead in your career. That maybe if I was a man, I wouldn't have taken this decision, but I'm taking this decision out of my sense of empathy. So my question to you basically is that, do women have some unique strengths in professional environments according to you? I think women in power, women confident, women self-dependent, women skilled, women spiritually and uh, economically and psychologically strong are doubly advantaged. I made it a double advantage. What could have been a disadvantage by if I were weak and I was dependent and not self-reliant and not so sure of myself, I could have been a liability. I made my gender an asset. It is a fact. Emotional intelligence coupled with in intelligence quotient and spiritual quotient, all the three IQs, IQ, EQ, and SQ, believe me, in a woman becomes three times over better advantages. I used mm. it to my total. I didn't use it. It became my advantage. Why? Why? I got more trusted. I got more respected. I got more access. I got to hear people more. People reached out to me more. I got to do more problem solving. Why? Because I had the heart to listen. I had the time to listen. I had the time to see. I had the time and my heart did beat for them. That was a woman. Heart beating for them. But intellectually analyzing what needs to be done. So I actually got advantage of being growing up androgynously. Andro and gyne. And I, because of my sports and my NCC and my upbringing, I got the best of the traits of men and I got the best of the traits of women. Women traits I was born with, which I polished, nurtured, became very conscious. I, I'm a woman and I am born with these traits. But my academics and my sports and my extracurricular activities and my own conscious training and my home upbringing got me the best of the male traits. I had the stamina as equal as the men when I joined the Indian Police Service for training, as equal and somewhere even more. So I think that's where my androgynous uh, nature and development helped me make it doubly advantageous. Mm. And that's what happens with any woman CEO. Look what happened with Indira Nui. What happened with Indira Nui? She turned her gender to her advantage and she became one of the world's best known CEOs today. Why? Because she was too androgynous. She had mm. the same qualities she nurtured. She turned her gender into reaching out, connecting with people, and taking care and yet being very analytical, being very strategic, having all the stamina and the courage for and risk taking. She was, she's an androgynous CEO. That's why she, the world looks up to her today, today, the world of women and the CEOs today. I did not know that. I was growing exactly like that. Androgynously and with the best of the traits, without knowing this is a male trait and this is a female trait. But mm. that's the right trait. Having mm. being physically, I have enough stamina and very risk taking and totally fearless, totally mm. insecure. You see, fear when, when you become fearless, you become fearless when you have internal security. Because I was financially, uh, psychologically, intellectually, environmentally, family wise becoming very secure, I, d I was fearless in tough decisions. I was more risk taking. That's what these are traditionally called the male traits. So strategic. So I think that's where it, as I told you, I convert, not that I converted, my being a woman 
in a male profession at that time and delivering it as a successful woman, knowing what to do and what not to do, Say, saying yes to what and saying no to what. I think that's where it turned out. It, it helped me grow. It helped me grow all, in all directions. And even when I got dumped postings, considered dumped postings, it turned out to be a bonanza. It turned out to be a self in fulfillment because by woman's nature is to empower others. That's a typical nature of a woman, empowers others. She empowers others. See, it's a natural trait of a woman to empower others. What did I do? What have I done all my life? I'm, and a woman is a people's person because she's naturally people. So two things, empowering others and being people oriented. And she's also accessible and she also listens. These are very natural traits of a woman she's born with. Why should I not nurture those qualities further and being very st stamina oriented, physically very fit, having great endurance, risk taking, professionally skilled. See how it turned out to be to my great advantage. I was not consciously nurturing them. But my environment at home and my upbringing, my schooling, my education, my university, my sports, my tennis competitions, my ranking. I was India's number one and an Asian tennis champion. When has ever an Asian tennis champion and I was good in both. I was not I was not compromising on my educational uh, excellence, nor was I compromising on my sports. I went into the service with two streams. I was growing up parallelly. I was playing competitive tennis, but not to be a tennis professional. I was playing tennis to learn the rules of the game. Because life is a game to play. You learn to lose and win. And I was learning to lose and win. And I knew how to prepare to win. And I knew what when you lose, why you lose. So I think, therefore, sports played a very critical role in the uh, making me as an endogenous manager or mm -hmm. endogenous person. So you see, I emerged from being a woman to a personhood. So it was not a question of I becoming a woman or a man. It was a person. So there's a person in me which evolved, who happened to have the qualities of the woman, which I don't didn't, I kept uh, polishing and nurturing and acquired uh, uh, qualities of the man, which were uh, coming through my education and my sports and, and my home upbringing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, what I loved about your answer that you just gave right now is that you highlighted one of the biggest career hacks that they don't treat you in college. So the way I look at it, I feel uh, everyone has a mix of feminine qualities and masculine qualities and depending on what you have less, you need to build uh, that. So say if you're a very masculine man, often you lack an EQ, often you lack a sense of empathy, often you lack kind of a wide-eyed perspective on what can go wrong with things. And you have to consciously build those. Like a challenge for me has been building that whole emotional side out throughout my career. Parallelly, because I have so many intelligent, capable women that work with me, I have spotted some of their weaknesses also. And then we have to guide them through those as well. And it's different for everyone. You know, you'll often even see some men who are overly feminine in their traits, in their personalities. So they have to develop some of the masculine things. But my question to you is uh, about women in general, ma'am. And it's kind of going to be a hard-hitting question. So I'll, I'll give you that kind of disclaimer up front. But why is it that in India, we don't see more Dr. Kiran Bedis? You know, like why has, there, why has there been one of you? When I compare it, say, to abroad, there are so many more stories like yours. Then why in India do we have this one-off story of Dr. Kiran Bedi? I, we wish... No, Ranvi, there are many today. There are many today, they only need more and more greater visibility. There are many more. Okay. That's a fact that when I was growing up, I was ahead of my time. And for mm. that, the credit goes to my home and my family upbringing. I was ahead of my time. There's no doubt about it. I was the only probably girl who was playing tennis shorts and not in a skirt. Okay, well, let me let me rephrase my question. Why at that time did we see doc a few fewer Dr. Kiran Bedis? What was stopping everyone else? And during my time, the, we had conservative parents. Hmm. We did not have a, as progressive an environment as it is today. We didn't have the opportunities then as we have today. We did not have visionary parents in such large numbers as we have today. My parents were ahead of their time. That is why I became ahead of my time and stay ahead of my time. But now 
as I see myself around, there are many, many. Today, there are men now, women have broken all barriers. They've gone into uniforms in armed forces, haven't they? They've flown the best of the fighters, fighter pilots. They are into Navy, Army, Air Force, IPS, Director General of Police, Armed Forces. Where are they not today? The CEOs of companies, where are they not today? But when I was up there, we did not have parents of my kind. Those people, they were far ahead of their time. I knew it. I knew my parents were ahead of their time. I recognized it. Why? Because all my class fellows, parents were only, only dressing them up, saving money to marry them off with dowries. Whereas my parents were investing every bit of their penny into my education, into our education. And we were not one. We were four girls in the house. All four were invested. So my parents had said, sky is the limit for your education. Keep educating yourself. Look, girls in India, particularly still, still girls in India, still the product and extension of the vision of their parents. Let me tell you till now how they educate them, what kind of sense of freedom they give, what kind of nurturance, positivity, optimism, etc. So I think mine was I'm a beneficiary and that's a blessing to me. What I did, what happened was while they gave me their 100%, I gave them my 100%. And I think we became 200% rather than being 50%. Whereas my other friends were probably becoming 30%. So many of my friends would meet me even now. They said, we knew you would be this. We knew you'd be doing this because you were doing exactly this. You see, so there's a continuity. And my friends still lament that they lost out. Why? They didn't lose out because of them. They lost out because their families did not give them the wings to fly. My family gave me the wings to fly as high as I wanted. And I did. Yeah. Ma'am, so I'm going to rephrase that previous question once again. And I'm sorry about the way it came across. But I have to kind of get to the bottom of this because it's something I have been thinking about. We had an entrepreneur called Kunal Shah on the show and he brought up a, a stat which said that something like only 5-10% to 10 of urban women are a part of the workforce in urban India. And that's where these thought tangents start. And that's why I ask you that why are there not more Dr. Kiran Bedi's? I mean, your story was spread across the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And you would assume that women who grew up seeing you in that position of power would think that no, even I can do something. Also, what I get from how you describe your own career is, is you had a strong self-improvement mentality. That was a sports person inside you uh, kind of plumbing ahead, you know, going ahead in your own career. But what do we need to do to kind of have more women think that much more large about their ambitions? I feel there's a lot of Indian men who do. And again, there's a flip side to that. A lot of Indian men put pressure on themselves about, you know, oh, I need to be the provider, etc., etc. But uh, in saying that, a lot of Indian men put lots of pressure on themselves to aim really far. And for some reason, you just don't see that culture in Indian women. And I'm sure society has something to do with it. So what is that? Why? Why is this happening? Why is there such a small number of women in the Indian workforce? You must understand, there's a great still bias against a woman. And where's the bias? The bias is in the homes. And the bias is a lot in the mother and the father. It starts with parenting. You see, in my case, it was totally the opposite. It was totally the opposite. It was saying, you've got to be, sky's the limit. My father used to say, your sky is the limit. And, you, and he used to say, you are, life is on an incline. You either go up or you come down, Kiran. I continue to climb the stairs because I know if the moment I stop, I will, I will, you cannot on a staircase be static. You see, either you come down or you go up, right? That was his message. But here, I'm telling you, the bias begins with homes. What messaging is being given by the parents as they groom their children? And the way they grow up, boys and girls, that's when the bias is. What kind of language they're using for their daughters? Tu to chali jayegi, tu to ek din chali jayegi, to mera kaun dekhega? They don't say this to the boy. Why don't they say, Main tumhe padha rahi hun, tum me se jo bhi mujhe dekhe, bahut achha hai. Tu bhi badi ho ke, mera dekhegi, tu bhi badi ho ke, ladka bhi dekhega. Jo bhi dekhega, competition hai aap me. Why doesn't she say that? Mother parents don't say that. Why don't they also say, you will carry forward our, our family name. Ye thodi tera naam badal jayega. See, so why, the bias is in the home. 
then the kind of quality education the kind of openness environment the kind of grooming of shared home why is the boy not trained to share homes uh, home responsibilities along with the girl along with the sister the bias is in the home right then the best of investment in education why is more investment given into the boy because they feel the boy is the son is the security whereas the man woman is a migrant i'm using the word migrant again and again because this is where the so why have you still not woman been given equal property rights even when there's landed property why why is she being deprived so therefore i think then the way they marry they when they talk the exist the uh, uh, the urgency or the hurry to marry the girl so that she vacates the home and leaves the home for the son to and the daughter in law to come in these are biases in the family are before you go into the career the girl in growing up is suffering a serious bias in the houses till now i had none they have all these biases that's why this 5 or 10% it's others who and those who broken through the 5 10 12 15 percent by now and those the credit goes to the family to a large percentage and then also to the uh, to the girls who broke free or and they were inspired by their education by the nbas they did or the engineering they did or the medical colleges they did right they broke through or the media the inspiration uh, we all uh, people became inspiration for them so they took inspiration from around around and they broke free the third is parenting the parenting is never shared and the, it holds back that woman back again why is parenting not taught equally why because they don't see it happening in the house so the woman is losing out all that she's earned is going to go kaput the moment she becomes motherhood she's mother moment she's a mother the marriage changes her motherhood changes her so the one m second m third money changes her because she's if she's not economically self reliant she's dependent on the husband or oh, after all the graduation you know some women even make a blunder they going for joint accounts they start making joint accounts our oh, whatever i'm earning now we have a joint account and now she starts asking can i withdraw can i withdraw my god this is not the grooming that's the grooming which has not happened when she was growing up to be trained in financial independence to be trained to be equally capable with offer and be to be an asset to us to be self reliant i think the word is self reliant self dependent and then learn interdependence not dependence you can learn interdependence but do not learn dependence you see so i think this is the grooming you i'm answering your question the seeds of bias are sown by the parents so if you want to change you need to change mothering you need to change fathering you need to change parenting and you also need better teachers who keep grooming but teachers come later the kind of impact homes make grandparents make elders make on the child every day it's a drop by drop by drop and if she's continued to get a feeling that she's not equal or she doesn't have the same capability or she's not been able to going to be uh, to be as equal or as assured and as secure as independent and confident as my brother or if there's a similar business if see you have very uh, rare experiences uh, rare uh, 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 situations where the companies are also now being headed by the daughters you have ready brothers you see ready apollo is a very rare institution where all sisters are leading the uh, uh, apollo hospital all sisters the ready sisters because of the father or is it because they didn't have a brother i don't know that but all sisters are leading the apollo chain credit goes to the parents so you see if you go back we and nobody is taught parenting in the uh, in uh, anywhere in the world you just become a mother you just become a father and then you start treating you don't you're not trained there's no pre marital there's no grooming what is this to be parents hmm that's the key yeah uh you you know you actually covered a lot of my further questions that i was going to ask you attached to this honestly but i have some stuff to ask and still kind of discuss this topic with you uh so i spoke about the tangent i got from the entrepreneur who was questioning you know that why are there fewer women in the workforce and i think his blame was towards indian society and all that and that's fair and that got me thinking that no what's the actual source of the blame then i had a conversation with my mom on this podcast and my mother told me that when i was born she had to take a step back from her career consciously 
and that time i thought okay cool thank you mom i appreciate your sacrifice but over time the obvious question was why didn't my dad take a step back somewhere then i'm grateful that he didn't because then he gave me the life that i lived out you know and this said that yes there's definitely some role of parenting that actually uh, kind of finds its way into indian society and pulls back a lot a lot of women so the actual key here is to train men in fatherhood and for me the second key and this has come from a conversation i've had with a korean citizen someone from south korea who was talking about his own parents so this man was about 40 years old and his parents are probably 80 years old now and he said that when his parents were growing up south korea was a very poor country and they got independence around the time we got independence but the way that country has economically grown it's crazy and women are a big part of the workforce there and the part of their hard power the soft power all that so he said that the key is we have a culture of getting married very late in life like we we grow emotionally we grow our iq eq sq up till the age of 35 then we know what we want in a partner and then we go for marriage therefore that 40 year old man can be a better father to a 5 year old son than say a 30 year old man who's got to kind of establish his career has the pressure of earning money and then that kind of affects the marriage as well i feel the key for me is delaying marriage and and kind of telling more indians to delay marriage don't get married at 23 don't get married at 26 if you can at least delay it till like your early 30s i think that's the key ma'am but what do you think absolutely do you know 1m changes the woman it's money how she deals with money Second M which changes a woman is marriage. All right, that's manageable. All right, as well. The third which dramatically changes her life is motherhood. What? There, she, now biologically, yes, she slips back because biologically it takes a toll on her body. It takes a toll on her time. It takes a toll on her energy. It takes a toll on her health. And if she's young, if she's young, Below 20, it takes a heavy toll, right? I'm glad that the marriage is age is being considered to be now becoming 21 minimal. It's a, absolutely because 18 used to become even 16, right? So if even if we make it 21, it will still be 20 around 19. You'll see this. But the point is, it's good. Why? Because now the woman will now have seen the world around, maybe learned a skill, learned the economy of scales, etc., and maybe learned about. What is sexuality? What is uh, what is motherhood about? She'll have become more trained and educated and little skilled, little more self-reliant, right? But the, still the point is, even if she's skilled, she knows how to manage the money. She's now employed, but she's mother now. Who manages the child? Is there a planned child? Did the, uh, did the father and the mother together think through, think through what's going to happen to her career? Why? Because the workplaces do not provide any support. Our social systems do not provide any child care support. There is no child care support in our, in our major companies, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods and our environment. There is no child care support. And what happens? If she has family support, yet, and family also becomes a dependent if there is a, uh, uh, elder care. So she is a nurse in the house, she's a wife in the house, she's a mother in the house, and she's a work person outside. She becomes four in one. Earlier, she was a wife and maybe nurse in the house. Now, she's a wife, she's a nurse, she's a mother, and she's also employed. And she needs the money now. But who is helping her in the house? Nobody. Because that bias hadn't been uh, uh, broken. The boy hasn't been made to grow up to say, look, if you are a father, you have an equal role to play. Manage the home equally. Manage your parents equally. Thus, the your wife doesn't get to lose her job. Nobody does this prior contracting and discussion before motherhood, before mm. parenthood. Nobody does that. See, there's mm. nobody. And then, the, where are the companies which provide uh, 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 family support? Or after school care? Because now the child needs to be dropped and picked up. Who gives after care? To nannies, we don't have a nanny support. We don't have trained nanny support. Do you know there's a huge need? Just as every office needs security today, every working woman or every working parents need nanny support. Mm. But where are the nannies? Are we doing any trained nannies? Trained nannies who can be paid and compensated or be well qualified and well provided for? There's no nanny support. 
credible nanny support if it's a boy you need a boy and if it's a girl child you need a girl is there a nanny support a working woman naturally would drop out of work so the employer knows they're going to lose in fact it's because of covid you have had women continuing to work from home right otherwise they would have dropped out that's why women do, do you know what happened with my life moment i became a mother i suddenly realized my god where are, my my daughter who looks after my daughter i can't leave her to a male male orderly i had to get a nanny transported from amritsar but that again wasn't enough i requested my parents mummy why are you living all alone in amritsar why because we were all such a close knit family can you please come over to delhi we can all live together because i you know i never wanted to be a migrant let's all stay together right and guess what thank god my in laws no question of they opposing the fact that how can your parents come and live with you it's my home it's our home so it became our home the home became open for my mother in law and my own mother sometimes i had both the mothers taking care of my child so it became intergenerational support how many women are fortunate to have mothers at home how many uh, working women highly qualified re reaching the top have this kind of nanny credible nanny support see unless a working woman uh, let's say parents parents realize that mother parenting means somebody's uh, career time lost how do you regain because the woman to jump back i think she loses out so much uh, career wise com uh, com uh, compared to the men so i think that's not taught that's not talked that's not discussed when we are talking about marriages we looking about ah oh, i'm about to be a mother i'm pregnant and i'm going to have we going to have a baby we have shower baths but what happens after who's going to lose the job who's going to well some women would would happily like to skip they skip these are all personal choices i'm saying everybody have their own likes preferences and feelings about i'm not against or for i'm just talking to you limitations where she's looking for support does it exist we need nanny care support we need corporate family care support we need after school corporate support we need all these support and we need intergenerational living together at the moment we're going more towards single family parents living in a, but dude we don't realize what a strength they are if the elders are at home for the grandchild it's a big support so i think these are unaddressed issues and they are at the moment the real ish challenges before a working woman or working parents and the men are still to realize the what it is to nurture a baby and play an equal role in father some are some are i'm not saying all i'm not generalizing anything but this is the need of the art so i'm answering your question why 5% why 10 why don't they make it to the top of the ladder because they drop out for their children because there's nobody else to take care of no business, corporate support no social support no networking support no intergenerational generational support where do they go where do the children go children need mummy children need mummy they need daddy but they need mummy first always mummy when it's in pain mummy when they want something daddy they need both but they need mummy but mummy can't be all the time in the workplace so she's last starts making part time she last starts skipping i think these are the ch social challenges which working women who want to make it to the top of the world top of the this society needs to address these issues and we must go in for a very good cadre of child care trained which and if they're paid for by the company or if they are able to be provided for i think we need it very badly if possibly also encourage intergenerational support and even geriatric care even elder care when they have medical issues who takes care it's only the wife normally who goes and takes care of the husband she again loses out on work so we need even elder care so these are the challenges for a working woman providing uh, having support system in elder care having home care even housekeeping even housekeeping so i think these are the challenges which actually hold pull her back to back to her traditional role of housekeeping or home making mm. ma'am for me the solution is probably three pronged the first is because there's genuinely a demand for these kind of businesses there has to be some kind of entrepreneurial angle around child care and generally childhood i feel there's a lot of businesses out there that can be built around people having children that don't exist in india yet so it's in the indian entrepreneurs turn you know people watch shark tank india and all this 
but look at a child's life and figure where you can help and make the life easier for the parents the second obviously is education of all sorts like the more people get educated you know even if it's as simple as teaching someone a second language teaching everybody english suddenly they'll be exposed to education and perspectives from across the globe you know so maybe the second one is education but the primary game changer for me and i'm i'm speaking from my own career experience i've had a 6 year career in the field of content i've seen how mindsets of people have changed so it makes me think that from a macro view i want to see how far the internet gets into the country and things like this conversations like this podcasts now this will reach some woman somewhere who'll have like a tiny shift in her perspective in terms of no i'd rather maybe it's a young girl who's getting ready to get married she's on the arranged marriage circuit she'll ask the right questions to the possible guys that she's meeting and look for a guy who is into the concept of fatherhood who is emotionally stable you know ma'am and and the 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 rebuttal to i i won't call it a rebuttal but i do want to chip in and say that from the perspective of men men are not even emotionally aware of themselves most men like we had an army major today we had a film director today and we spoke about men's emotions and these guys are accomplished people like on the show we recorded with them today but somewhere there's so many questions about our own emotional sensibilities because there is a certain amount of very heavy pressure put on indian men to provide for the family since we're like 4 years old we're told that if you don't study you're going to become nothing in life no one's going to marry you and you're going to turn into you know something horrible so every indian man deals with a crazy amount of career pressure which is there even in men from other countries but not as much as it's on indian men so i think some fundamental shift needs to happen which is only going to happen through content through maybe even like culture you know movies coming out about these topics tare zameen par had a direct impact on my childhood it changed my relationship with my parents uh, i used to have adhd as a kid so you know my teachers used to complain about me that this kid is like too hyper but my parents started understanding that situation better and just let me be so sometimes movies can really kind of shift culture which brings me to the next question and this is not me asking you about you it's asking you about me i need advice in life at this stage because i feel like um you know uh, we we're done with money uh, like money is all right and i think i'm going in the right direction when it comes to money but often now that damaged indian boy inside me questions himself about legacy so i want to ask you about this concept of legacy ma'am like how do you look at your own legacy uh, do you look at it as something you wished for early on in your career how do you look at it now like what how do you look back at your life would you change anything uh do you still have uh you know even deeper say career ambitions i'm trying to wrap my head around this concept of legacy because it's honestly been troubling me because of the narratives that i've been fed from the world of sports you know build your legacy go kill it there should be movies made about you but even that puts pressure on you as a man or a woman or whatever you are so uh what's your take on legacy ma'am i think i had more potential to administer and serve and give better uh, original ideas in governance i could have been used better i could have been used more i had that in me maybe i was born with it or i was blessed with it or i nurtured it my department the indian police service has not fully fully realized my potential they kept dumping me into positions it is my own dint and determination which made me kept emerging out of it let me give you an example even the position of deputy commissioner of police traffic was a dump nobody was going there in when during during ninth asian games i was just told one day you got to do it and that's it it was just an year and a half i didn't know anything about the roads i knew it's going to be a waterloo because i how would i handle entire delhi for traffic right it was a dump for me but you know because people were not willing to take that risk but after i left it became a very prestigious position to be in but the point is but after i had accomplished a lot in the asian games traffic management i was moved away immediately sent away instead of realizing and allowing me to now take the whole system forward and systemize it i was shunted never realized to put systems in place then again my draft, uh, uh, crime prevention asia i moment i was blooming i was putting systems in place i was shunted out then there was no place for me 9 months there was no work for me i was sent as ig prison because nobody was going as inspector general prison in tehar nobody 
It was lying vacant. So when I was being um, sent, there was no work for me. They said, there's no work for you. Finished. So I was nine months being paid. One day the accountant said, I can't pay her more uh, unless you give her work. So promptly an order came, posted as Inspector General Prisons. Because what did happen? It was a dump. But today, it's a, it's a, it's a, a marking place for the next police commissioner of Delhi. It's now such a, such a, 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 a position of huge value. I was dumped. But what happened from that, we emerged again. It was an emergence. It was sheer determined. Then I was overlooked to be a police commissioner of Delhi. I was the you, Delhi, India world over would have had a first woman police commissioner in the world. I would have gone in by merit. I was on merit, five open. So here again, I was excluded. They never realized my potential. We would have put systems in place of crime prevention and my strength was crime prevention. That's why I succeeded in uh, prisons because I trustedly believed in crime prevention. It's a Maxis Award which highlighted the whole work. Otherwise, for me, it was a dump. But being overlooked to be a police commissioner of Delhi, when I had the seniority and my somebody who was next junior, four years junior, he even if I'd done my two years, he could have got a tenure of two years. But it wasn't. It was a now get her out. Why? Because I was not the part of the club. I was not part of the boys club. That boys club. See, so I was isolated. I didn't have the political support. I was out. I was told, go and meet so and so, then you will consider you. I said, I don't meet. You are the union home minister, sir. You are the you are the end of the service. You are the one who has to decide. I shall not go anywhere else. I did not. What happened? I was overlooked. The news came at 10 p.m. at television at night to avoid. Why? Police Commissioner of Delhi appoint order came at 10 o'clock at night to make news on television at night. So it doesn't make news during the day. Next year, this news was stale. I was overlooked. What did I do? Self-respecting, self-respecting, totally secure. I put in my papers and I took early retirement. Why did I? Why did the Indian police service lose my very valuable another two years of my service? Had I been the police commissioner of Delhi, I would have put lots of systems in place which I'd experimented with and succeeded in my earlier assignments. So I think this is what, do you know the only time to be honest with you when I've realized my potential is as Lieutenant Governor Puducherry. And I was given full five years to work. First time in my career, Ranveer, in my 40, 30, less than 40 years of so, I have had a posting where I fitted like a T and I was given on merit and I was trusted to go and serve and then nobody interfered and look the kind of work we could create, we could turn Puducherry around, we could document, we could totally made it, make it into model. That once, once I the past that the political hostility and the Western leaders came in the way, that's different. But the fact is, I was picked up by the prime minister himself, given me an opportunity. I'm not, I'm not praising him. It's not a political thing. It's a, I'm telling you a sequence. First time in my life, I was called when I left the service. When I left the service, I was called, would you like to go and work there? I said, yes, sir. First time in my life, I asked myself, I'm even being asked, would you like to go there? Otherwise, I've only been dumped here, dumped here, dumped there, thrown there. I, you won't believe it. I even had a police, Delhi police assignment, which had no work. So when I asked my joint commission, then commissioner, sir, you hosted me as joint commissioner policy and planning. Can you tell me what is the policy and planning? He said, you got a car, you got an office, you got a secretary. I said, yes. He said, that's all. Go. I said, then, all right, sir, here's my study leave. I want to go home, uh, back to my, um, I want to now go for my Nehru scholarship. I'd achieved a Nehru scholarship and I went and wrote a book. The point here is, my, if you're asking me my legacy, I think the Indian police service, the, my Delhi police department has underutilized me in my this life. It is I who kept emerging out of postings which were considered as low end. Low end. When I should have been posted as joint commissioner of ranges, they were sending me into some other back, backyard postings. So, they, but the point here is, the only way, as, as I said, the uh, last assignment, which is the left and governor of Puducherry, has been exceedingly fulfilling. And to me, that's my legacy. Because I've documented this work in my book called Fearless Governance. 
I've done it as a sense of duty, conscientiousness, because the work was so collectively successful, despite all odds, that I felt it my duty to do justice to the historical documentation. And that's why this book has been written, Fearless Governance. And you know, it's not, it's not for selling. I'm sh sharing my soft copy everywhere, saying, please read, because I'm looking for grooming of leadership. The young UPSC, the young civil servants, the young should read what, what leadership is all about, where they can do it all. So this is my legacy. You know, I, I, I hear you. And one, I'm very honored that you're using our platform to express yourself this way, because I don't see it with people in positions of power like yourself. You know, people don't talk so openly. And this is one of those strengths of women that you have showcased, that you're okay putting your vulnerabilities out there. Uh, I also wish to ask you, and this is slightly, you could call it from a spiritual perspective, how should one look at legacy? Because that's the big question in my head. Legacy as a concept, what is that for you? Because uh, we had we had a Sikh spiritual leader, uh, Satpal Bhai of Nanak Nam, and he said that, uh, you know, spiritual growth is all about egoless service. So that was, that was the outcome of that podcast for me. And uh, that really got me questioning about my own legacy. That why am I putting so much pressure on myself about legacy? Because therefore I'm putting pressure on myself about my own ego. So what's your take on legacy generally as a concept also? My take on is very simple. I've not done anything for legacy. Hmm. I have only worked one day at a time to be honest to what I was before, consciously, conscientiously doing my duty and uh, doing, give it my all, not my best. Give it my all. Now, if that leaves a legacy, so be it. But I have not ever performed any duty. I've documented this book. My Puducherry work, I've documented not for legacy, but to do justice to the collaborative teamwork which we could achieve. It is to do justice. Otherwise, who will tell you the story? So it's not a legacy. It's who will mm. tell you the story. If I don't mm. tell you, then who will tell you the story? I didn't want to die with that story in myself. I wanted to live it. So it's beyond me, the story will live. So that Puducherry mm. can always have this is the way we can turn things around. If public servants do their duty honestly, if politicians deliver for what they've been voted for, India will never suffer good governance. It will always have good governance. Mm. It will never suffer uh, them suffer wrong people. If they all, that, that's what I've written in the book, is what are the key things? What have I said in the legacy? If you say legacy, what is it that I'm trying to promote through the book? Be visible, officers. Politicians, be visible. Be true to what you've been voted for or you've been appointed for. So I've been looking for appointed and the voted. Appointed and nominated or elected. Appointed and elected. What are your responsibilities? You may have your needs, but don't forget the reason for which you've been appointed and elected. Once you do not forget the purpose of it, whatever your ne other needs are, the government the Indian Indian people will never suffer bad governance. They'll never ever suffer. They will always have good governance. The money which will be which is budgeted for them will always remain for the common man for which it is meant and not get diverted. Today, the money has been protected a lot from getting diverted thanks to direct bank transfers. And I had a lot of opposition to implement direct bank transfers because contractors were very, very tempting, right? Or the, uh, the other areas where there were a lot of leakages which have been saved. So I would say I've never worked for a legacy. I've been only looking at one day at a time to do justice to what I've come for and also to see a sense of self-fulfillment for myself because I owe to myself what have I grown up for if I'm not going to deliver and succeed. So I want to succeed so that everybody wants to succeed. I believe in empowerment. I gave a tea a mantra when I took, over the, took the oath of office. The T mantra was trusting, empowering, and accountability. I said, I trust you, you trust me. I empower you, you are empowered, feel empowered. And third is, I shall remain accountable as people, you remain accountable to the rule of law. When I said it, mm. first time a speech was made by Lieutenant Governor at the oath ceremony. But I gave the T mantra to the people of Puducherry saying, I shall remain trustworthy, I shall empower you, and I shall remain accountable. You remain accountable to law and you feel empowered 
by uh, that will be your removal of poverty when you participate in the rule of law right and you remain a, a trustworthy if we remain trustworthy empowered and uh, accountable puducherry would be a model what we lost out on had the political class not come in the way and not unnecessarily been hostile we could have offered a, the model to the world of what a collaborative government that's what indira nui said it's a blueprint of good governance indira nui released my book and she said it's a blueprint for good governance the leadership practices which have been given in the fearless governance cut across private and public sector mm. that's what she said in the book release of a coming out of her means hell of a lot and she read the book when she released my book so that's what i said i have not done it for legacy i have only done it it was my duty to full i have looked at kar- i am a believer in the karma yogi concept i believed in doing my karma and for me work is worship for me work is worship exactly the way my for my mother bringing us up was worship for her work is worship for me work has been worship and trusting that it should remain till the last day of my breath hmm oh that's beautiful ma'am as as our, our generation calls it this has been one wholesome episode you know it, it's a very feel good episode and i have to ask you sort of a i don't know if it's a feel good question or a deep question to end this particular one but it's something i truly wish to ask you are you happy at this stage in life and what is happiness for you today after a long time i my self master of my own time and it's a very fulfilling i spend my own time reading i'm doing exactly what i'm looking for and i've, I've just finished writing the book actually right now now we are we are discussing the book so it's still not given me that whole time to myself the book re- see i re- released the book only 3 weeks ago a few weeks ago so now at the moment it's a follow up of the book lot of webinars on the on the grooming of leadership i think it still take time for this to settle but once it does i do not know what comes ahead but but i am there to uh, see that my every day remains a day of accomplishment where i get a sense of fulfillment i do i owe this to my country i owe this to my service and i owe it to my family no dr kiran bedi ma'am thank you uh, i know we're not supposed to talk about legacy and we're talking about being a karm yogi but uh, for me considering where we are in the world of content I feel that your content legacy has just begun. The more podcasts that you appear on, of course selfishly I want you to be on our show again, but generally the more podcasts that you appear on, the more nectar you can like, you know, give out to India. I feel in the long term, both in Hindi and in English. So I I mean I'm no one to encourage you to do anything, but I would gently nudge you towards this world of podcasting, ma'am, because there's a lot of questions that the youth has generally uh for thought leaders for uh, people who've been in positions of power and i feel you're someone who has a lot of experience so honestly of course i encourage the listeners to check out the book they'll they'll purchase the book we'll link it down below but i would encourage you to just be out there even more on the internet because you have that much to offer ma'am and uh, i'd like to probably end this one by just saying a big thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, i've spoken to sudha murthy ma'am i've spoken to you and the commonality i see between you two is that you have this aura of comfort around you and that's that's possibly the core strength of yours again going back to what are a woman's professional strengths the core of it is this like i didn't feel for a second that i'm talking to dr kiran bedi i felt like i'm talking to some relative who's looking out for me so thank you ma'am this was one of my most memorable podcasts the good news ranveer is that i'm using this book fearless governance to groom leadership Mm. So now it is I'm not declining any webinar request any podcast request so I sometimes have 3 3 a day 3 3 a day but I choose them I, I it's my choice but it's after they've read the book so when they I do a webinar my condition is here's my soft copy please read it I want the youth to ask me questions and challenge me because I am now wanting to groom the next generation of leadership So I am doing exactly what you're suggesting. Thank you. you. This is a wonderful thought, and exactly I'm doing that. I will continue to do this. No, ma'am. Ma'am, just thank you for everything. Thank you for this episode. Thank you for everything you've done for the country, ma'am. I salute that as well. 
uh, and just I hope to see you again. Hopefully, the next episode will be in person. And I I hope and wish all the peace and happiness uh, in the universe be in the palm of your hand. Thank you. So grateful. So grateful. Thank you. All right. So that was the episode for today. It was extremely special because speaking to Dr. Bedi was a dream for me, and the dream has come true through this podcast. That's been the journey of this show, you know. I'm getting to talk to so many people. That's what people don't understand about podcasters. That uh, this process of podcasting really opens up doors, opens up the possibilities of intense conversations just like this. It opens up change within the podcaster's mind because you're getting educated through the guests. This podcast is my higher education and it was just an absolute honor hosting Dr. Bedi. You know what? At this point, I'm also going to add this extra clip of this conversation that didn't make it to the podcast. But here's what she had to say. And Ranveer, I want you to know, I saw your mother's, uh, you and your mom's show. Oh, wow. wow I really? loved it. I, your oh, mom that... was so authentic. She was so honest in all that she said. I think it was a lovely episode. I oh, ran I... into it. You know, it was not searching. I just ran into it as if nature conspired that I wanted to, they want me to see you with your mom. And I heard your show. It was so wonderful. You wow. got such a wonderful mother. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm going to cut this clip. This is not a part of the podcast anyway, but my mom is, this is going to be one of the greatest moments. She, she's a huge admirer of yours. Like she, she doesn't care that what I've done in my career. But when I say that I've spoken to people like yourself, that's like the highlight of her life. So the <laughs> fact that you're saying this, ma'am, it'll be very special for her. Please, my regards and great respect to her. You see, she raised many issues which have come through your questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess she's still, she's still her biggest mentor in many ways. So that's, <laughs> that's what right. I'll say. Superb. It's great when sons look up to their mothers as mentors. That's, I think it's the biggest blessing for mothers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Wow, thank this, you. this is a great conversation. I just <laughs> thank you. I have that's right. That's the magic of this podcast. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that someone like Dr. Bedi has consumed that conversation that I had with my own mother. I feel Dr. Bedi's got infinite podcasts left to give to the world and that's what I'm hoping for. I hope she returns on the Ranvi show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please share it with as many professionals as you possibly can. And also, Remember to follow us on Spotify. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This one was special. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you share it as much as possible. Thank you for listening in.